Okay. On air, I'm just going to turn the screen share on and we'll get going quickly. Um, where are we? Participants there, 230. So, hello everyone, and, uh, and you're very welcome to stepping up to secondary school. Uh, my name is Emmett, and I'm going to introduce everybody here in a second uh, and just kind of give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering. And um, you're all very, very welcome. So, uh, you should be able to see on your screen here now just kind of a bit of a slideshow, which I'm going to go through quickly. And I think in the top, you may or may not be able to see it, we have about 235 people logged on currently, and we might have a few more. Uh, they can join us. There's a chat function uh, here on the page as well. So if you can find that um, and you want to put something in and let us know as we go along, if you have any questions for the panel, feel free to do that. I'll be trying to coordinate things here and feed questions to the panel and so on. So I'll be trying to monitor the chat uh, and set the questions aside for the end. We have some questions here that came in by email. So we'll be covering them first uh, and then we'll take any of the questions that come in live as well. Okay, so that's that's everything. We'll make a start. So, like I said, my name is Emmett Major. I work over in the west of Ireland as a coordinator of a project we have here called Planet Youth. And with us, we have Gina Dowd, who's an adolescent psychotherapist who works, works here in County Galway. And she's very helpful to the project um, and gets involved with some of these things for us from time to time. Uh, Helen Butler is here with us, and she's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about Step Up and answer some of the questions. And Helen was very uh, helpful and did a huge amount of work in putting the content of the site together when we built this last May and June. Uh, and Neve O'Flanagan is also with us, and Neve's a school chaplain in Glen Namadi Community School. And she um, is fantastic. She also helped us with this uh, website a little bit. And when we did a presentation uh, on the website around this time last year, um, she helped us with that too. So, so kind of everybody's back to do it one more time as we're approaching very near towards the end of school. So, so that's it really. I'm just going to run through this um, kind of quickly, the presentation, right? Uh, like I said, I work for this uh, project called Planet Youth, which you may or may not know about. Some of the parents out in the West of Ireland may be aware of it. Uh, parents who are joining us from other parts of the country, less so. But it's other, you might have heard it as the Icelandic or the, the Scandinavian model, where it's a, a prevention model. So we're trying to um, improve the health and well-being of our young people by taking this approach that they used in Iceland called primary prevention. It's very much evidence-based and data-driven. So every two years, we do a very, very large-scale survey of our children over here in 15 and 16. Uh, all 90 of our secondary schools in the region take part. And what we're trying to find out is the risk and protective factors in the lives of young people. So what's good and what's bad and what's going on with them that we can influence, that we can change so that over time, uh, their health and well-being will improve. Now, in Iceland, when they developed this project, they used it to address their substance use rates, particularly. That was what they were interested in. And they went from the highest um, underage substance use rates in the developed world to the lowest over the course of uh, two decades or so. It took about 20 years, but it was very impressive all the same. So that's what we're uh, undertaking here out west. Uh, and the vision, or I suppose, it, I suppose this, the vision statement, the mission statement of the project is that all young people are happy and healthy active, connected to the families and communities, and most importantly for us, achieving their full potential. Because when young people get caught up in substance use behaviors in their teens and really get caught up in it badly, that's uh, that tends to go out the window, uh, their lives and the potential they might have otherwise had. So um, this is one thing I just wanted to touch on quickly, the first year parents booklet. This is available on the Planet Youth website. So you might find this interesting as a first year parent to download. If you're coming in as a first year parent to a school in Galway Mayor was common this September, August, September, you'll very likely get a hard copy of this as well as kind of the fridge magnet that goes with it around bedtimes. But it covers uh, bedtime, screen time, uh, substance use, time with parents and hobbies, that kind of stuff. I'll show the rest of it in a second and explains a tiny bit about the project. One of the key things though in, in the Planet Youth data was the sleep that young people aren't getting, I suppose you could say. About half, a little over half of our young people actually aren't getting enough sleep at 15, 16. And it's really, really significant in terms of all these different aspects of their lives, right? So the mental health, certainly, you can see a huge difference between the kids who are getting enough sleep and the kids who aren't. Uh, and then all sorts of other things. So school engagement is impacted in a big way. Uh, every aspect of their lives actually is critically impacted by lack of sleep. Um, then in terms of their social media use, which we talk about, the kids who are spending a lot of time on social media, which I suppose is a huge number of them, but the ones that are, are finding, pro it causes them problems in these other areas. So stuff like schoolwork gets impacted. Um, 
their anxiety and depression is increased, self-esteem goes is reduced, and you know their sleep is impacted as well. So we we cover that a bit in the booklet. Then there's also the stuff around substance use. So it won't impact you guys. You're coming in. Your children are twelve. They're th they're twelve. They're thirteen. It, it's not in the conversation. It will be by third year. Uh, we just try and give parents a small heads up. Um, in Ireland, we have quite a lot of tolerance around uh, alcohol use, particularly you can see there in the data. So parents, you know, they're a bit more tolerant, I suppose, around alcohol use. But it causes problems. So when we see in the data, these are the kids who reported being drunk in the last month, which is about one in five this time around. Um, it's the kids who are getting alcohol from their parents that are the ones more likely they're actually three and a half times more likely to be getting drunk than the kids who aren't getting alcohol from their parents. So when they come to you and they're asking at 15 and 16, can they have a few drinks before the disco? It's not necessarily the right way to go. And um, we'd be advising against it. So just to come back to that, it's available on the website. It covers things like family time, screen time guidelines, uh, bedtime guidelines are on there. Uh, hobbies and sports, important to keeping young people engaged and stuff that interests them. The substance use is there. And then we have this regular supply of alcohol by parents is 18%. And then 10% of our young people at 15 and 16 are regularly getting alcohol from somebody else's parent, which we'd be trying to discourage that as well. So that's that really. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about the Planet Youth Project, uh, it's a very big piece of work that's underway. It's an interesting project for sure. Um, and that little booklet there can be downloaded. Um, one of the things we try and stress, we do cover this in first year parents induction nights in the schools out west is, you can do a huge amount by uh, working together as parents. You know, if you know, you know your peer group of parents. If you know your parents better, if you make the effort to know everybody, um, it's a it's a massive protective factor. So that's it, really. Um, the website, uh, which we'll get onto now in a second, right, was set up uh, last Ju May June, and it was really in response to COVID as much as anything else. Um, there would have been practically none. All the kids were out of school at the time. They would have got none of their school transition program sometimes schools do a little bit uh, themselves a sixth class teacher might do a bit with the kids before in the last few weeks of school sometimes an outside agency if you're lucky an outside agency like helen's like youth work ireland galway they come in and do um, a transition program with the sixth class but not every school has a youth project in the area that has the time or the capacity or does that even so um so a lot of times they, they don't get that work and it's, it is quite important um they have a lot of worries about the move um just questions as well so this is what the, the the website is about it covers these topics you know how school works goes for school tips from older students uh some some stuff about self-efficacy or you know getting on yourself finding yourself a little bit as a student friendships feelings uh staying healthy the COVID 19 bits in there and there's a load of information for parents in there as well um just so you know this is the the analytics off the website for last summer so you can see here um, there was a huge kind of increase in traffic over the at the start of the summer um, when the website was launched, and then throughout the summer it was fairly heavily used. There was that these are the weekly figures. So, um, you know, around 100 young people a day were looking at the website, and you can see there's 23,000 unique, you know, that's unique visitors to the website. So it's quite a lot of use across the country of the site um because there was not there wasn't anything else out like uh, out there like it which is kind of why we built it really because there was nothing nothing else of you you know that was as useful out there so and uh, just to show you what the kids are interested in um these are the top pages on the site that they come to visit um so how school works uh how's the timetable of how school works skills for school you can read them there yourself okay so it goes you the parent you the student friendships lockers um staying healthy timetables again, COVID-19, planning your time, comms, skills for school. So those are the, the, the kind of the main areas that the young people are looking at. And you can see they're coming in at number six was the one that the parents were coming in and looking at. So uh, that's it really. That's the presentation I wanted to give. I'm going to um, say, if you want to get in touch, if you have any questions after this, uh, this is the, the contact details. So the Planet Youth website, you'll find everything there. Um, one final thing to cover is that we'll be covering quite a lot of questions with the panel. Uh, I'll make a recording of this uh, presentation. And what we'll do is we'll put it up online tomorrow. I'm going to stop sharing that now. We'll put it up online tomorrow and we'll kind of timestamp it. So if there was a topic that you were particularly interested in, like let's say if anxiety comes up or, um, you know, what about my 
child's old friends or we'll just put the categorize it so you'll be able to skip to the part of the video that might interest you most so uh, so you don't have to kind of sit through everything uh, all again and that's it really i'm going to hand you over to helen and say is there because i know helen you're we're well we all had problems with the technology actually but in terms of um the website is there anything that we could put up here online that you might find useful to talk about maybe start just with the the eight categories um emma please yeah i'm going to do that now so let me just open mm -hmm. this and that's the website and i'll share that and share that and can you see that now we can we yes yes perfect okay. So this is the landing page of the website and the top kind of line. If you go to scroll down a little bit on the page, you can see the eight topics there. Yeah. OK, so so, you know, like like Emma was saying, this was launched last year. And, um, you know, as a youth worker and somebody who delivers these transition programs to young people, there was a real serious deficit this time last year because children weren't in school and none of the preparation work was done. So the website was fantastic. This year, we're back doing these programs. I had one this morning, actually, the first face, well, the first indoor one I could do. Uh, I've been doing them in school sheds and school, school gardens for the last few weeks. Um, but it's really, really nice to, to be back meeting the young people. And the things that are coming up from them are, are things like organisation and, and a lot of things that are covered on this website. But the website was created by a, a group of volunteers from different organisations working alongside Planet Youth um, and who spent a lot of time putting it together. But it's not just a website that was written by adults as, as a resource for young people and their parents. We consulted with a lot of young people. So young people, we talked to them about what would it have been helpful if you had known before you went to secondary school? Or have you tips that you can give us that would be useful to first years? And then we also asked them to have a look at it from the point of view of how appealing is the website? How easy is it to maneuver around it? Can you find the information that you want? Um, so in that regard, it has been proved by young people, if you like, um, and, and the feedback has been really positive. Um, the thing about uh, going into secondary school is it's not just about the journey into secondary school. It also is that stepping stone that young people are making into adolescence. So there is uh, information on the website in terms of the, the, the eight different categories that are there. How school works, practical information, skills that you need for school, the tip, top tips from the older students, which are really practical. And the, they, they include things like, you know, try to come on time. Don't be early, don't be too early, don't be too late, arrive calm, and then your day will be a calm day. You know, really practical things. Information for students themselves, information for parents themselves. Um, we, we've added the, the piece around COVID simply because COVID is going to be a feature of our lives from now on. We don't know what the future will hold with regard to COVID, but it's going to be there. So the challenges of COVID, um, knowing what it is, even today I was suggesting to young people, they don't wear masks on a regular basis in primary schools and they're going to be doing it on a regular basis in secondary schools. So why not practice a little bit over the summer so that you get comfortable and find a mask that suits you? There's a section there about staying healthy, which is around about uh, the, the things that Emmett was talking about around sleep, um, food, alcohol, exercise. And then there's the one about friendship and feelings, which looks really at how do I get to know new people in school? How do I deal with the, the feelings that come up if people like me or don't like me or I feel like I'm, I'm left out or I'm, I'm part of the gang, things like that. So it's a lot of really useful information on the website. It's written in a very um, easy to follow, friendly fashion, which would allow you, the parent, to sit down with your young person and go through it together, as well as you looking at it independently and them looking at it independently. So it's, it's a lovely um, activity that you could do with your parents or with your child is to sit down and look look at this with them and show them around it so that they then can go come back to it later themselves. Another thing I think about this is that we also recognising the importance of empowering young people to look after themselves in this website. So um, things like preparing their materials and things for school, the, the tips around organisation are all about helping young people to do these things for themselves and not be depending on adults. So there's great scope there for you as a parent to support your child in becoming that independent person who's able to prepare their material and tidy up after themselves and things like that. So I think um, personally, I've referred umpteen young people to this website. I, I think it's a great resource. I send uh, little flyers about it out to, out to schools that I work with and encourage people to use it because like Emmett said, prior to this 
there wasn't anything online that was really useful. Then last year we had this complete deficit of information for young people. Um, and now we've got this incredible website. So I hope you can take the time to have a look at it, have your child have a look at it, and that you will find it useful. But that also that you'd come back to us with suggestions and improvements or new information that you think might be useful to have on it, because we're really anxious to, to keep it live and keep it moving and keep it growing. OK, thanks, Emma. Thanks, Helen. And we'll, we'll probably call on you again as we go. I'm going to I'll stop sharing at this point. And I just saw a question coming in on the chat there. The name of the website, which is uh, it's www step up all one word. So step up all one word dot IE. If anybody's looking, that's that's what it's called. Um, and like that, I'm going to try and monitor this chat. And I saw a question coming in here from uh, Jacinta saying my child is the only one going from right uh, from her primary show. She is alone. Shy. Any tips for her? So we'll get to that at the end. We're going to try and uh, monitor these questions and we'll we'll try and cover as much as we can anyway at the end we'll aim to, st to finish up strictly as we kind of said around uh quarter to nine um so we'll get to the questions if that's okay um and th the first one that came in my child is very anxious and i'm worried about him going into a big secondary school and that might be some one for just into we might almost be covering that but can i put that to you neve is that okay and neve yeah. is the ch it's a chaplain as we said in um in school chaplain in glen Amadi, so she's been there and has the t-shirt several times over. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thanks so um, I think that um, anxiety or anxiousness about going into secondary school is totally understandable, both for the parent and the student. Um, it's 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 there for absolutely everybody. Um, as Emma said, I'm a school chaplain in Glenham Addy. I've been there for 12 years now, and I would try to speak to all there's one to one as the year goes on, and even the most confident student will tell me that they were nervous about coming into secondary school. So that's a point that you can make to your child. Just reassure them that everybody is in the same boat. Um, you know, teachers are used to seeing new faces every year, and they'll do their best to make everyone feel as comfortable as possible. Um, in fact, this year we we still you know don't really know what our first years look like because they've been wearing masks all year. And uh, so that's kind of another issue. Um, but uh, as I said, everyone is in the same boat. I think it's a good idea maybe to get your child to speak about their anxieties. What is it, what is it exactly that is um, feel anxious? Uh, bring it out in the open and uh, suddenly it might become just that bit less scary. Um, I think it's amazing really how, how quickly groups accept each other and um, people just get on with it. And I do feel that if your child has extreme anxiety or you're really, really concerned, get in touch with the school beforehand. They may be able to facilitate you going in with your child for a little walk around the school a couple of days before um, you to go back. Um, I'm sure a member of staff would be more than happy to meet them and bring them around. And that can alleviate a lot of anxiety for students, you know. Um, and I know that certainly would be a, a, available in our school, so I'm sure it's there in a lot of schools. Thanks, Niamh. Um There's another one here. I'm worried about the amount of time my child has had away from learning because of COVID. How will he catch up or even get motivated to learn again? Did you come across this one? Is that for me, Emmett? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah um, absolutely. You know, we've had a really, really difficult time, uh, I think, across the board. But the thing to remember, everyone is in the same boat. Everyone regardless of where they are in their learning has been affected um, and everyone is at a disadvantage whether we, li we like it or not and online learning has been okay but it doesn't replace the real thing so um, I think uh, really you know the thing to remember is everyone is starting off fresh in first year and that's actually a good thing so they're starting out with new subjects subjects they may have never done before and uh, it's up to the teacher to make sure everyone in their class is going along with them and they're, they're following along. And teachers are good at differentiating um, their teaching to suit their students. Um, I always tell my children, don't be afraid to ask a question. If you're struggling, if there's something you're not sure of, ask that question because there'll be someone in the room who wants to ask and just was too. So get them to ask those questions. And, uh, you know, with regard to motivation, Yes, that's difficult. Even for adults, we're finding because of COVID, you know, everything has been knocked 
on its head and everything has been kind of skewed and our motivations are as good as maybe they would have been when we were um, in norm, a normal run of the mill um, time. But uh, usually when people are back in together, that motivation just takes care of itself. Thanks for that, Neve. Can I put that one to you a little bit as well, if you don't mind, Helen, because I know you, you've been doing some work with young people who've been struggling with motivation uh, this year. Is there any kind of thoughts or tips you have around that? Well, I think, I, you know, I think Neve's point that everyone's at the same place. If, if you know, every parent feels their child is a little bit behind, but if everybody's back, then we're all at the front. The front is just a little bit further back from where we started from previously. Um, so I think that's an important thing for, for parents to understand. I think encouraging your young person around things like reading, um, engaging in activities and motivation, talking positively about school. I know that... Um, you know, no child is going to want to spend time in the summer holidays studying or brushing up on stuff and nobody would want them to. And I'm sure after online learning, no parent wants to hear tell of such a thing. But um, what I would say is talking, talking positively about school. Always, I think, saying when you're going to do something, never saying if, if is something that has a great deal of doubt associated with it. Whereas when is full of possibility. So when you're settled in school, when you start to do this, when you get a handle on what you're doing in school, um, talking like that, I think, is really important. You can spend time over the summer maybe working out a study space. Uh, you know, in primary school, a lot of children would do their homework in the living room or the kitchen and places like that. Really not a good idea in secondary school because they do need to be able to concentrate without distractions. And it's so important, if you can at all, to get good habits going in first year. So where are you going to study? Do we need to buy a little table? What about getting you a lamp? Do you need a notice board? And, and creating this enthusiasm for it, you know, and wanting to do it, I think, is, is part of that, too, in terms of the motivation. Um, don't know if that helps, but yeah, thanks for that, Helen. Appreciate it. Uh, Gina, there's one here. My daughter was isolated, bullied quite a bit by peers in national school, and it wasn't handled very well. These same girls are going to her secondary school, and I'm worried she'll be left out. She refuses to talk about it now. You mm. come across that? Yeah, it's actually. Um, I think at, at some point we we all have an experience of a fallout. We've an experience of bullying. We've an experience of this transition that that comes in national school, and sometimes it reaches its peak in fifth and sixth class. Um, when somebody is refusing to talk about something, we have to imagine that it's very painful, and so the reality of it is, I'm struggle to name that, or I struggle to be vulnerable, or I struggle to talk about it. And as we know as ourselves as adults, sometimes dealing with things, we'd rather put our head down and say, "No, it's fine. It's not happening." So it's very similar for adolescents, but we also know that every everything, you know, how we deal with our inner world drives everything in our outer world. So if this parent can, and it sounds like they've already dealt with this and it sounds like they have understanding, so it's continuing that. And it's, it's building resilience in adolescents that's so important. And if they can feel resilient and they can feel there's opportunities while they may not be able to see them yet fully, it's helping them build that picture of what now looks like and what the future looks like. So, yes, we, we've dealt with this. You did extremely well, acknowledging it may have been very painful. And now what do we hope for in the future? And sometimes I, I ask parents or adolescents when I work with them to think of situations almost in three ways. What's happening? OK, I'm, I'm feeling a bit nervous and anxious. And as Neve said there earlier, that's very normal. And as Helen said, OK, how, how can we look at that? So what, why is that happening? Well, it's happening because I had an experience of bullying and I got very hurt. And how are we going to do with it now? So that child will have already learned some resilience and some coping strategies. And it's OK to be honest and it's OK to be nervous and to be somewhat afraid well then it's looking at the skills the competencies the values that that child has that that family has and saying right we will work this out together you can't be with your child adolescent in school but you can be with them in your spirit you can be with them in their their thinking and their feeling self and that's very important and sometimes i would even say to adolescents you know you bring in something with you, be it a worry stone, be it something you have in your pencil case, 
a little smiley face that's a reminder, you know, it's okay, I'll get through this. Thanks for that. Um, Neve, this one here about, um, I think you might be able to feel this one. My son is going to a secondary school where there's a big emphasis on sport and I'm worried he'd be left out or picked on by others, presumably because he's not a sporty child, you know, so um, what do you yeah. think? I so imagine that's a fairly common one. It was when I was a child <laughs> for myself. <laughs> I've a personal experience of this. Um, my son is not sporty at all, at all, at all. Um, and uh, he's now going into transition year. So from a parental point of view, I totally get this one. Um, I think, you know, it's difficult. I worried so much myself about it. Um, I, You know, my son just couldn't understand why you would kick a football around a field. He just didn't get it. And there was no way that anyone would convince him that it was a good idea. So um, what I found, though, was that there is a growing tolerance towards um, the non-sporty person. And the big thing is to, you know, there are other extracurricular things that you're, uh, that a student can look at. You know, there's music groups or there might be a chess club and, you know, stuff like that to look for other strengths that they have rather than, I suppose, dwelling on the fact that they're not sporty. They'll find a niche. Um, now, it might be a case that the person mightn't be particularly sporty, but might want to give it a go. And I think in that case, and I know Gina already alluded to the word resilience. I think it's an opportunity to develop resilience. Your child will not be good at everything. And that's the way life is. None of us are good at everything. And um, it's a good learning curve um for you know those days it, it, the day, in primary school it seems true you know you get a medal for anything but in actual fact um you know life can be tough and you might not be picked on the teams first and you might not win the medal and you know so they're 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 character building things um i remember a few years back um henry shefflin the hurler was in our school giving a talk and he said that uh, when he was 14, he was not chosen for the under 16 team and he was gutted, but he didn't give up and look where he got to, you know. So I think, uh, you know, really, I suppose I would um, strongly advise looking at other extracurricular areas. I find extracurricular activities are vital in, in, in development of, a, of an adolescent, absolutely vital. So find something in the school that suits your, your, your child. Yes, um, you know, break times will revolve around kicking a ball for boys generally, but they will find the people who don't do that. And, uh, uh, you know, they'll find their feet. Thanks for that, Neve. And I, just to touch on that, a lot of schools do extracurricular. They have stuff, they have after school clubs, they might have break time clubs and stuff that people can do and try. And some schools do, some schools don't, some schools are very big on it, some's less so. Um, but even outside of school, that's one thing, you know, that we we do know that it's whether it's at this age or younger or even as they become coming into their teens. If young people have stuff that they're interested in, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's sporty, that's great. But if it's it could be it can be ballet, it can be stage, it can be music, it could be, you know, anything at all. Volunteering, it doesn't actually matter as long as they find something that they're interested in doing that fills up their spare time. Um, those are the kids that seem to do really well when we look at the, the, the data, you know? So um, that's one thing we're trying to do a lot of work on in the Planet Youth model is, is try and really develop that le leisure time space for young people. So they have much more access to hobbies and uh, extracurricular activities. So yeah, it's really, really for personal development point of view, it's huge, yeah. Um, there's one here, dyslexia, I suppose learning support and other things we could put in as well but um, my child struggles with dyslexia i've handled it i have handed in all the reports for her and i'm wondering what sort of supports there will be for her in secondary school that probably varies a bit from school to school Nia, would it yeah i'd say it does but generally speaking um every school should have a good learning support department um i think it's great that this this person has handed in the reports the reports are the key get them in you know if uh, you feel like your child is struggling with dyslexia don't be don't be you know in denial of it uh, because you're losing valuable time 
Um, just like the sporty question, I also have a child with dyslexia, different child. So um, uh, she now um, has just done the Leaving Cert. So I've been through six years of having a dyslexic uh, child myself go through the system. And I would say that really the supports she got were absolutely amazing. Um, you know, uh, it might be possible with a specific learning difficulty that uh, your child might be um, Irish exempt, which means that they won't have to sit Irish and maybe learning support will be offered at that time during the time uh, during the timetable, uh, which is always good. Um, otherwise, I would say, you know, practical things like don't maybe pick a language, you know, don't put added stress on that student because um, if they're struggling with dyslexia, a language might not be suitable for them. Um, they may need access to an SNA. Um, schools vary um, from place to place. Sometimes an SNA will be assigned to a particular student or a group of students, and they might travel along with them through the years. Other places, they rotate the SNAs, and there's pros and cons to both. But the big thing is not to kind of have too much reliance or too much dependence on the SNA. But I think the days of uh, stigma being attached to learning support are over. I feel anyway, certainly, you know, um, I could be in class calling the role and I might say, where's such one? And they just say, oh, yeah, at LS. And it's not an issue at all. So, um, you know, the supports are there for a reason. And um, obviously it is more difficult to have a child with a specific learning difficulty than without. But the supports are there, thankfully. And there's a lovely to add to that. Um, I have two children with dyslexia. It's a lovely book and it's called The Dyslexic Advantage. And what we now know about dyslexia is the amount of creativity, the amount of knowledge, the amount of wisdom that children, adolescents, adults have with this particular learning style. And while sometimes we get focused on the academic, which is very important, it's to focus on your own specific learning style. And adolescents tend to know that. And it's developing faith in themselves, like the football, like subjects. Oh, gosh, I'm really good at this. Because when we start to put in the word, I can't, we, we get stuck in our mindset often of the things we can't do. And it, it blocks out what we actually can do and what we can become passionate about later on. Whatever our skills, competencies, um, learning style is. We, we all find things that we gravitate towards and that we excel at. Thanks, Gina. Um, OK, here's one I might put back to you or to everyone, really. But um, I, I say the website might be good here. But is there anything I can do to help my child to be more organized for school? He's not great when it comes to organization. <laughs> I think this is a question for everyone. And it's a question for every parent. And sometimes. As a parent, we have to think of the, our own organizational style because we know what happens when we're trying to get out the door in the morning. And it's usually because we haven't prepared or we haven't put in the reminders. Children, adolescents, they need reminders and, and they need to be shown a task several times to get into the, the swing of it, the routine of it. And if you have the patience to show or, you know, gosh, my child is better at getting ready the night before or my child is good in the morning. You know, th there's no point, and, and all of us have been there where the stress levels go up and we say we should have done this, could have done this. It's all about the night before. It's all about knowing your particular style and helping your child learn theirs and having the, the patience and the perseverance sometimes to say, right, we'll do this. And I know, Neve, you have some particularly good tips there on organisation. Yeah, and I, I would be saying the night before, definitely. Mm. My my preference, <laughs> because I know that when the morning comes out the window, but um, you know, uh, every student should be given a locker, um, so encourage them to use the lockers. Um, what I would say is certainly have a lot of kind of bits and pieces. So, for example, art. There might be an art pack. So, what I would do is go down to the discount store and buy those large envelopes, those zip lock envelopes where uh, you can just chuck all the stuff in for that subject. So your child is reaching for just that envelope, all the little bits that go with it. Um, what I'd say is 
have a timetable on the fridge. Also, you can laminate uh, a mini version of the timetable that you keep in their pencil case and put a timetable up on their locker. Um, I know when I table every year, I have to colour code it before it makes sense. It, I can't do it unless it's colour coded. So the thing I do is I get out my marker <laughs> and uh, I'm years looking at the timetable now and I still just can't do it. Um, what else can I say? I would say just um, walk through the table the night before. What do you need? Have you got PE? Have your PE packed and ready? And in the hall, don't skip over it in the morning. Otherwise, you'll be forgotten. And uh, there's nothing, nothing more frustrating or um, upsetting for a student when they've forgotten something. You know, I've students where they just are genuinely so upset. Oh, I forgot my ingredients for home economics or whatever it is, you know. So organisation is key. And I definitely think the Ziploc folders are just amazing. Any any thoughts on that one, Helen? Yeah, um, I think even highlighting on the timetable the day the subjects that you've got the extra stuff like the home economics ingredients and the PE clothes, um, you know, or or even for the young people who now are, you know, maybe getting their first phone or they've just had their first phone since the summertime, getting into the habit maybe of using the alarm system on their phones. You know, it rings at six o'clock when I'm at finishing my dinner. Uh, and it's got PE tomorrow. So that's my cue as a young person to go get my stuff. And as Gina mentioned, I mean, this takes perseverance on the part of a parent because it is so much easier to go get it yourself. But the thing is, we're, we're, we're trying to get from doing these things for our children to a place where they can automatically do them for themselves. Um, and that won't happen if we keep diving in and going, I'm so her. I'll get it for you, you know. So, but it does take perseverance. It does mean, you know, bite your lip, keep your hands in your pockets, just leave it, you know, and, and uh, endure it because it is worth it. Remember, this is September of first year. It's the start of five or six years of school. So, if they can learn good habits in first year, those habits will carry through. You know, now I can only lay claim to having had success with our youngest child on that. But simple things like when they finish their homework at night. Pack your bag for the morning. Make sure you've got everything in it, your locker key, your pencil case. Leave it inside the door that you'll be going out. Leave your coat with it. Leave your PE gear beside it. So even if you do sleep in in the morning, you've time to have breakfast and grab your bag and go. And you don't have that anxiety that will overshadow the entire day then, really. If you arrive in school in a, in a, in a heap because you were late, because you forgot something, because you were anxious about it, that will carry through for most of the day and we'll, we'll, we'll put a, a shadow over the whole day. So, you know, checking in, have you got, oh, I see you have tomorrow. Have you got your stuff ready? Rather than, oh, you have peed tomorrow, I get your bag. You know, things like that. I think it's worth it in the long run. It's hard in the short term, but it's well worth it in the long run. Did we cover um, I, uh, the idea of having the timetable up in as many places as you can possibly stick it? <laughs> you know, so have the copy of the timetable on the fridge, in the locker, on the you know inside the you know the journal you know a few copies up and around not to, for you as well as for the young person so you could maybe add, one is one is so they kind of have a bit of sense what they've got tomorrow but there's times when maybe you'd want to ask them about their day or how was it and how was this or how was that you know they might have said they're not you know oh that teacher's horrible or whatever how did you get on with that class today or you know so it's, it's, it's always kind of a nice thing as a parent to be able to know roughly how their week is going you know and maybe you can check mm. in with them good idea to have it up yeah. on the fridge mm -hmm. I think it's a really good idea because i think as well in a timetable there's a good chance that there's one day of the week that isn't a favorite day that maybe has more of the subjects they, they're less keen on or things like that and even to know that day and just to even that day to have their favorite dinner or say well i know wednesday is not your favorite day of the week so i may do whatever what you're really saying there it's not about having their dinner it's about i noticed and I cared enough to do something different, you know, and you're really showing a connection with your child's life, I think, which is an important thing too. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Um, maybe Gina, you could try this one first. I'm worried about my child's confidence, right? She's really shy around other people and tends not to talk much. It wasn't too bad in primary school because everyone knew her from when she was small and the class is small, so they got on well together. I'm afraid she'd be left out of other groups in secondary. So sometimes as, as our, our children start to grow into adolescence, sometimes we have to begin to think about our language around 
certain personality types because we know that we all grow and, and we change. So sometimes I ask parents to think about the word shy and to perhaps alter it a little bit that your, your adolescent has a reserved style, your adolescent has a quiet confidence. Because sometimes we can hold on to that word shy and we can think, oh gosh, there's something wrong with me or, or, or we carry that and we say, oh, I'm no good in groups. And, and we tend then to almost unknowingly to ourselves carry around a label that perhaps is no longer useful or relevant. So if you, if you have a, an adolescent with a reserved style, Look at your own style first. Look at your style in the family. Is this generally um, a, a quiet family, a reserved family? Is there someone that we can borrow in, from in the family that's perhaps more outgoing? And it's asking your adolescent, well, who, who do they gravitate towards? Do they like to be with the loudest person in the room, which will naturally make them step back a little bit? Or do they prefer hanging out with someone that's similar to themselves? So you're really asking them what do they think their style is and how do they want to grow and develop it? Because we can have people with such a reserved, quiet, gentle nature, and yet inside they can have the most resilience, the most amazing confidence. We don't always have to be outspoken to be the most confident person in the room. It's how that nature comes across what perhaps you can begin to talk to them about oh gosh, well, with that particular style, I would imagine you would make a great president one day. And, and it's building again. Often we have to begin to give adolescents the picture of their life. So then they've got something to anchor on to. They've got something to look forward to. I certainly know um, one of my children, um, when he started in national school, very, very reserved in himself, didn't speak for a long time, but he was busy checking everything out. I mean, he he, he doesn't stop talking now, um, which is wonderful. But he chooses, you know, who he speaks to and when he does. And, and I really admire that. I absolutely do. Because if we're not speaking, we're observing. We're learning a lot. We're taking it all in. And then that adolescent can tell you an awful lot more. Um, so then it's it's going to their qualities and skills. Well, what did you notice? But naturally, we worry, you know, and especially when there's a gentleness or there's a calm or there's a quietness there. And we want to sometimes say, speak up, stand up for yourself. You know, you'll be OK. You'll be resilient. And they are. But they might be stepping back to do that before they can step forward. So it's trusting their style. It's trusting your style as a parent. Trust your own communication adolescents make it and they do wonderful the gentle ones the chi the chatty ones the all different types and they learn to find their tribe just as we do as adults and we do and and it does work and then maybe you check in on a particular teacher or at a parent teacher meeting you you know or you send an email and you have a quiet word i just noticed and i'm wondering and you you can consult with your your adolescent about that. I'm just checking that out, you know, and I'm 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 looking out for you, but I'm wondering how you might do that for yourself. So it's ongoing communication, as much as that energy allows sometimes, maybe not on a Friday evening, maybe it's you know on a Saturday when you're in the car together, but you're constantly checking it out and how are you doing? There's one here. How can I help my child get ready for going into secondary school, particularly when there was no induction day? Was there induction days this year? Some people did, some people didn't. No. Yeah, it varies, I expect, from place to place with, you know, restrictions with COVID and stuff still. So um, I know there's stuff up on the website uh, about that and also the idea of having a good idea to maybe check out the social media and website pages of the schools because they'll have good information and sometimes there's maps and there might be timetables and who's who in the school and that kind of thing. Can I just touch on that with you, Neil, for a second? A lot of schools, well, schools are all different, but every every single school has like a, like a pastoral care type setup. Every, you know, each child will have a form head and a year head and a person to talk to. And, you know, there'll be the chaplain or the guidance counselor, and the, but not just them. There's a, there's a general kind of a care team, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, every every teacher has a pastoral, pastoral role. role. 
Yeah, I turn yeah. up turn up the turn up the mic and turn it on. Turn your mic on again. Turn your mic on again, Nate. No, is that the question? Let me try that again. So, uh, what I will say is that just like the prepping for a school that we covered with all the different timetables around the house and all the rest of it, that's a good thing to do. The fact that there was no induction, um, it is a difficulty. Normally, you'd have, uh, we'd have brought in six class kids there in May, they'd have had a bonding day together. Um, they'd have come in, come in from all the different um, schools. So that didn't happen, but that didn't happen for our current first years and they did fine. They were grand. Once they came in, we did all of that. Um, so really, I think things like having maybe a practice run over to the school where um, there might be anxiety about, about the building, um, that can be a big thing for, for a student because they haven't been in there. Um, they haven't physically been in there. So even a drive by and look, there's the entrance and look, if they're going on the bus, that might be a big thing where, um, you know, it's a, it's a big thing for a student to get onto a bus where other people are already sitting down looking at them. Um, so to just talk through those sorts of things. Um, just, I suppose, really, um, their school websites, they can be looked at. Um, what will normally happen, what's normally explained in induction day would be um, the pastoral care team. So as, as Emmett said, there'd be a year head. There's the chaplain, there's the guidance counsellor, there's the deputy principal, the principal. These are all kind of points of contact for a student who might have a difficulty. But generally, everyone is helpful. Um, some schools have peer mentoring groups. So um, the senior cycle kids might be assigned to a, a group of first years. Um, and that works very well in our in our school anyway. Um, but I suppose the thing is to talk favorably about school to your child. You know, um, I think Helen said it earlier, this idea of when you go into school rather than, you know, um, rather than, I suppose, treating it in a negative light. When this happens, this is how it will be. Or, you know, and to try and remember, I suppose, that um, things have um, things might be different to how you experience school yourself. So if you have any kind of hang ups about school, try not to, I suppose, let them um, uh, uh, pour over onto your child because they will pick up on that. So to just talk positively about when you go to school, it'll be great because, you know, and uh, have a few little um, things to say about that. Um, uh, the journal will be a means of communication. If, um, if a teacher needs to talk to you, they'll probably write a note in the journal. Um, schools they usually use web texts that sort of thing so things that you would have missed out on on the induction day you'll get that information that law will be passed on um you know regardless of um the covid situation we're in now and it's reading and rereading things sometimes as a parent so that 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 you know what's going on because i think what we found with the pandemic more adolescents have spent um time online so there's a, a lot of people talking about addiction to screens now and getting them off screens. I think we can all remember the, the Sunday night before school and it was checking, is my homework done? Um, what program are you watching? How much screen time are you got, getting? We know that um, screen time increases anxiety and stress. We know that from research. So if you have somebody at home that is particularly anxious, particular worrier, Start to do the wind down time with them. Start to do, maybe it's an extra cuddle. Maybe it's an extra chat. Watch out for food. I mean, less sugar before bedtime, less screen time. It all helps to waking up in a better mood. It all helps to reducing anxiety. And anxiety is real. And we have lots of terms for it now and lots of different types of anxiety. And we certainly know that it has increased with COVID and it has increased with isolation. So you, you can't do that check-in and that pre preparation soon enough. It's really important. And they may want to be chatting to their friends, you know, on a Sunday evening and all that's really important. But then, you know, like when they were small, it's preparing them for the next day. So good sleep routine, good um, diet, good health routine, wind down the mind 
Um, and I'm a big advocate, and, I, and I'm never popular among adolescents with this, but I say it, you know, no phones in the room. It doesn't help. It, it adds to stress levels. Oh, I need it for my um, alarm clock. Well, we all have a euro store pretty near us that we can get a two euro alarm clock now. Um, and that is a big thing for them to become responsible about too. And it's to do it in a different way, but certainly reduce the screen time. It reduces anxiety and you will find that on any website, on any anything related to adolescent stress. Yeah, thanks for that, Gina. We were actually came up so strongly today. We had a meeting today as part of Planet Youth with a lot of our school principals in the region. There was about 35 of the school principals along, which is a great turnout, you know, and a lot of knowledge, you know, huge amount of knowledge mm -hmm. in terms of education of our young people. And that was the thing that came through really, really strong in the classroom is the amount of kids come in and sleep deprived. It's uh, it's and it's phone related uh, and if particularly phones in bedrooms. Because if the phone is on and it's buzzing, buzz, mm -hmm. buzz, you know, it can be, they're up, they're up, they're up. And we can't concentrate, you know, no. we all get contrary when we don't have enough sleep, but especially for a younger person, they, they need 11 hours sleep at least. And their, their brain activity is trying to come online. Their executive functioning is trying to come online. They're busy dealing with puberty. They're busy dealing with change. There is so much activity. Yeah. So anxiety naturally gets heightened during adolescence. Well, if there's, like I was showing at the presentation there at the start, if there's one, if I had a magic wand and I could change one thing about the health and well-being of the young people, it would be the sleep, definitely, mm. that they're getting. And that's very much phone related, you know. So somehow mm. in first year to get the habits good around that stuff, um, you might have some chance to keep it going, but it is hard. There's no doubt, doubt about that. It's very, very hard. It is, and we did have it very it easy. I, I find that it... What? Sorry. Sorry, Helen, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say what I find very handy when I'm talking to young people about this is um, because, again, you don't want to sound like the mammy and you don't want to sound like the person who has given out about things and, and it makes you very unpopular. But that, you know, the, the really deep sleep that we get when we've been in bed for a while is the sleep where our muscles grow, where the, the hurling injury we got has a chance to recover, you know, where the information we learned in school that's in the front of our brain has a chance to settle in the backs of our brains and things like that. And if you don't get that deep sleep, those things won't happen and you won't get that deep sleep if you're constantly being interrupted by your phone with notifications and with the blue light coming on. Um, and if you're talking to first year boys who generally tend to be quite small about the idea that if they're not getting enough sleep and their bones won't grow and whatever, I've, I've had parents come back to me and say, I don't know what you said, but he never took his phone into his bedroom after that day. You know, so sometimes it is about coming at it from that angle rather than you need to be getting your sleep as to what, what happens when you don't, you know, mm. and it, it, it's helpful. Mm. There's one here. Um, you might know this, Neve, around and I expect every school is going to be different about subject choices and things like that when you can opt in and opt out. But my child found it hard to pick his subjects when it, what if he starts a subject he hates or is no good? Can he change? Mm. Yeah, again, I suppose all schools are different. Um, some schools would have tastes for sessions for subjects. Um, some schools don't. I know our school doesn't. Um, and we do have students who end up in a subject that they just can't handle. And um, general rule of thumb is if there's room to accommodate them in another subject, that would be allowed. Um, when it comes to choosing subjects, what I would say is try not to get too career focused at this stage. Um, your child is only 12 or 13. Um, so for example, if they're good at art, but you think, ah, they're not going to have a career in art, let them do art. That, was, that would be what I'd say, because they'll have a chance to shine for that 40 minutes or an hour in that, uh, that day. And um, it'll be a subject that they'll enjoy going into. Um, if they're musical and you think, well, they can do music outside of school, let them do music. I would say, let them do what they're good at. Just look at what they're good at for the minute. Um, I said it before, if they struggle, you know, don't choose French. <laughs> um, a French is a problem, can be a problem. I'm sure other languages are as well. But um, if don't think that you have to have your child in these highly academic subjects, because that's not really what it's all about. It's all about a holistic um, education. 
So um, uh, what I'd say is if they're in a subject that they regret picking, try to change before Halloween so that they haven't missed out on too much. But um, yeah, change is possible. Don't get too hung up on subjects, but I would say look at your child's forte and uh, follow that. Guys, we're getting short in time, so I just want to try and rattle through a few of these questions quickly. It's not that easy to do that, but um, if a student is particularly weak at a student, are they expected to do the same amount of homework as everybody else? I don't know. I expect they are, unless, unless they really are standing out or struggling. Is that one you come across, Neve? Yeah, homework is usually an issue. Um, it, I, I don't think that a child should be sitting for hours doing homework if they're struggling. And I think a note in the journal would be the way to go. Yeah. Just to explain, look, we've tried. And um, what most teachers would say is once they're showing that they're trying, um, so rather than not attempting the homework to do some of it, um, it might be a case of agreeing with the teachers, look, my child is particularly weak in a subject area. Um, you're giving uh, six questions. Is it OK if they do two to three of those questions? And I don't think a teacher will have a problem with that. There's another one here, Neve, that will feed kind of off of that a little bit. Is my, <coughs> my child is worrying about how he's going to do such a long day at school and then come home and do more homework and then fit in sports in the evening. It's that idea of, you know, yeah. there's a lot of... Definitely, it's difficult and it is a juggling act and it takes a lot of discipline at the beginning um and they'll be tired they'll be very very tired um particularly in the first month um but you know with time you know that will improve and i think the thing is to focus i would say try and get the homework done straight away when you get home like have something to eat and get go straight into the homework don't be leaving it on the long finger um because what will happen is you'll procrastinate you'll get into that habit and suddenly then it's panic stations you know trying to get it done so i would say just get into a good homework routine but you know as i said before life does not revolve around the academic that's what i would say and i feel personally <laughs> that um sports and um extracurricular are just as important so if you're having an issue if there's an evening when um a, a child won't get all their homework done try and see subjects wise you have that timetable on your fridge Go to the timetable and see, well, what needs to be done for tomorrow? Rather than saying, oh, have to get this done. Say, for example, they might have science homework on a Monday evening and they might not have science again until Wednesday. It might be possible to do the science homework on the Tuesday evening. So, you know, they're kind of strategic things that you can do to help with homework. But yeah, it's difficult. It is difficult. Should should a desk in my child's bedroom be set up for homework instead of the at the kitchen table? Concerned they'll be dossing up there without supervision. I have one like that. Um, Don't know what's going on in there. No, yeah. Any thoughts? Anyone? There's a look. There's a lot of answers to this. If you think when they go into secondary school first, it takes six weeks to create a new habit. Think of anything we do. It's it's a six weeks period. So it's a lot of trial and error as much as for the parent as for the adolescent. So, of course, you have to limit distractions in the room, like any of us, when we go to do a piece of work. You know, who, who's looking after the phone is number one. Um, do they have a snack? When is their break time? And they're learning as much about themselves and their style as you're learning about your style with them and then their style with you. So allow that trial and error period. Yes, they can have to take on a certain amount of ownership and responsibility themselves and sometimes they find out there's consequences when they don't have it done and which teacher is easy going and which teacher may be less so so sometimes we have to let a certain amount of um error happen uh, and then it's picking it up again and saying what works i mean we'd all avoid doing homework of course we would unless we're really passionate about a particular subject and you want to do well in it so there's a natural, um, I suppose, there's a natural path that's going to take place. And again, remember, as the adult, you're creating that picture for them that they can't yet see or imagine. So for their well-being, which involves their um, physical well-being, their emotional well-being. So if they need reminders in the room and you find sticky notes help or you find a cup of tea helps, you'll fall into that routine. 
and there will be resistance and there'll be tired days and sport days and it's going with it but as long as you're keeping the communication open about what is working and maybe what's not working so well you can constantly review and that's what family life parenting being an adolescent is about it's about change review and learning good thanks gina we're getting a bit tight on time i'm going to try and just squeeze in three or four more of these and we'll we'll try and wrap it up then there's one here that i think it seems to be maybe that there's a young person that's joined us to send the question i'm afraid of getting bullied uh, how can i stop worrying Any well let's about... this word choice right we, we we have choices and sometimes as an adolescent we feel our choices are lim limited so i would be asking this this young person um First of all, what's happening in their own head? You know, is this an experience they've had or is, is it a panic and a worry about predicting the future? And then once they can establish that, why is it happening? So they may have some experience of this. Somebody may have said something to them. So it's. And then I would ask them, OK, well, how can we deal with this? Have they consulted with an adult, a parent? Um, have they experienced support before what has worked before and what might possibly work now we know we have an amazing brain but we know our brain gets busy trying to protect us so it builds up habits very very quickly so if we have particular fears the brain very quickly adjusts to developing more fears and more fears because it believes it's keeping us very safe and then it ends up in as an anxiety as a phobia sometimes as school refusal, sometimes as panic attacks, all those things. So we want to reduce those all the time. So we have to check in. Is this relevant right now? Is it happening right now or can I deal with it tomorrow? And we sometimes we find that we're, we're very poor fortune tellers because we go into the future and we predict a lot of what's happening when we often need to slow it down. Simple techniques, slowing down, breathing, connecting with other people i'm always a big fan of you know who can i turn to for some support here because that could be very real to that person but i would certainly talk about it talk about it with an adult who can support because adults are there to support and there may be various adults in that person's life but don't carry that burden because it only gets bigger much bigger Thanks, Gina. There's there's a few questions here. They're quite similar in theme. I'll, a I'll ask them all, but they're, we could probably answer them all at the same time. So, um, okay, there's one here about my child is the only one going from her primary, so she's alone and shy. Any tips for her? My child doesn't know uh, many starting. What advice can be given to make new friends and settle in? And there's another one quite similar. Um, my, my child is starting secondary school and knows no one there where well, there will be groups of children who do know each other from other primary schools a bit worried about them settling in so any thoughts on that Neve? i know we have a lot of kind of mentoring programs a big brother big sister extracurricular would be a big one for them to get involved in that kind of thing but it's my experience anyway that things change a lot in the you know within that first term you know yeah. the names change that are coming in the door i was oh, they were all the best friends have changed and you know yeah. Yeah, uh, groupings change all the time and they change throughout first year and throughout second year and throughout third year, particularly for girls. And um, boys will generally just go around in one big, huge group and they don't seem to differentiate with, about who's in the group and who's not in the group. They just kind of travel en masse. It's very funny to see. Whereas girls are quite specific. They have, <clears throat> they have their little groupings, but that changes all the time. So I wouldn't be a bit worried. There'd be ample opportunity for them to chat, make friends. Um, a, a little tip might be just do a little role play with your child before they go in. They haven't met these people before. So have a few questions up their sleeve that they're ready to ask. Like, you know, have you any pets or uh, what subjects did you pick? Or, um, uh, you know, what's your favorite subject? That type of thing. Just so that they will chat to other people because Friendship starts with chatting, really, doesn't it? You know, it's that little connection. And to, you know, hold them, uh, hold their, their shoulders back and stand up tall and smile. Make that connection with other people. You know, don't wait for people to come to you, but just get out there and do it. Um, I know Gina covered um, about, you know, the different strengths within the, the people. 
within the different individuals and that is just so um so true and i hadn't actually thought of it that way gina well done it was it's great <laughs> i'm learning from you as well but um what i would say is yeah just look they'll be fine they'll be fine try not to preempt it they'll mm -hmm. be fine talk positively about going in and i think as helen said when you make friends when you talk to these people when you meet the other people you know um i think that's probably most of this one here we could try and cover my we're not going to get to everything unfortunately time wise but my concern is the mask already as a mom of somebody who started last year it made so things so hard hard to see a smiling welcoming face hard to breathe hard to connect without face-to-face -face contact you struggled last year and found it hard to make friends even break times there wasn't groups allowed no th that kind of thing hard to make new friends especially if you're coming from a small to a large school sort of feeds into that the mask thing it's tricky isn't it yeah they can take off their masks while they're eating yeah so that's that's it is it, it is that that's kind of the lunchtime thing that, they can talk yeah, yeah. also yeah. air um i know like i can only speak for my school but air breaks so when they're outside they can take their mask and um so yeah but uh, we've all found the masks tricky you know um i think anyone who has to wear them for any kind of period of time finds them tricky but um, try to get, uh, if they're, you know, finding it hard to breathe in them, try to get the ones with the little filters. Some masks are better than others. Try different ones out um, during the summer now and uh, see what one works best for, the, for, for your child. And don't forget that eye contact is such an important thing. You can see someone smiling with their eyes. You know, don't underestimate the power of the eyes, I would say. But yeah, it is. Okay, guys, I think we've kind of covered, no, we didn't get to everything and we've run a bit over. Um, apologies if we haven't covered everything. What I'll do is I'll, I'll try and get this time stamped and put up online tomorrow. It'll be on the Planet Youth website. And what I'll do is I do have the email addresses of everybody that registered, which I won't be keeping, but I will um, send, you, send out a, a link, if you like, to the video tomorrow. So if there's anything you want to go back to or maybe bring your child back to to have a look at, you know you can do that again it'll be a little bit time stamped uh if you want to send in an email you know at some point maybe tomorrow or later tonight even if there's a question you really think you know would be beneficial to cover we'll try and do that as well um but i think we covered a fair bit of ground tonight you know and hopefully allayed some of the concerns and fears um that parents have and maybe um you know you'd be able to pass it on to the young people the website is very good we were reviewing it helen there a couple of weeks ago seeing what we needed to change and we said you know what it is actually pretty good. It's all it needs to be, at least, at least for the time being. You know, so there's a lot of information on there. Most of it is extremely child friendly and to be used by the children. And um, they can navigate, you know, practical all of it. What we were suggesting is it's a nice exercise, maybe to go through it a little bit together. You know, in the first instance, and and um, you know, go through a few bits with it. You know, with them. Uh, and there's some bit information on this, you know, one of the topics there is kind of you, the parents, there's a little bit of information for parents, but it is actually, it's pretty well put together and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty useful. I think some good reading in there. So that's it. Any, any last thoughts guys you'd like to add or throw into the mix before we wrap it up? I suggest to parents, you know, trust your parenting style. This, this maybe you already have adolescents in secondary school. Maybe this is your first time. Everything we do as a first is always challenging and somewhat daunting, but we do make friends. We, we do integrate, we do learn, we do find the joys of schooling. And I think, as we know, as adults, we can look back at a lot of experience and go, oh, gosh, wasn't that fun? But sometimes we're in a hurry on to the next moment. And what happens to the moment you're in if you're in that rush? Trust your style. You know, if you're getting the fine, OK, and you, you have a, a, you know, an idea, you, you have a, an inkling, there's something else. Try and approach it in a different way. I understand everybody's busy. I understand the impact of COVID. It has been horrendous. It really has. And sometimes we, we just need to peel back the layers a bit and we'll say, OK, what would I be like if I was in this situation and what would I need? And then your adolescent, they do open up. And all the research shows that they want to open up to a parent, to an appropriate adult, because that's who they trust. So you're building trust and you're, you're building a strong, resilient um, adolescent who, who's going to be in charge of all our futures, which yeah. is a wonderful thought. 
Helen, I noticed there was one question that came in um, around the word, you know, the word which we expanded around a bit, resilience, how to build, you know, what is resilience, how to build resilience, how do you instill resilience? I think you touched on it a little bit, if not a lot, really, when you said it's letting them go a little, you know, trying and failing and yeah, that and kind I, of piece. Yeah, this is this is a natural part of life. Moving on to the next stage of life is so important that not that we're there to try to do things for our children and we do want them to be successful um, at those changes, but supporting them and being there to catch them and letting them fall from time to time. I, I don't mean in a bad way now, but, you know, like like I don't know if it was Jane or Neve that said, you know, something they will forget things. You know, you can be the parent who runs home and gets it and brings it in, but they will forget it again next week. You know, if you do that, um, in, you know, helping them out, maybe you will run home if it's the teacher that they, they like the least. Maybe you will run home and get the book for them, of course. But really um, allowing them and maybe looking when things do go wrong, having a little chat about what would have made this work? What do you think now from this position would have made this work? And, and you know, they may say, well, I kind of went to bed too late last night and I was really tired this morning. Well, what can we do next? So how about if I reminded you at such a time that you have another 30 minutes before you need to go to bed? Would that help you? So you're working together to come up with solutions rather than either, you know, criticizing or complaining because something went wrong or trying to fix it for them because we're trying to protect them. It's natural to protect, but they do have to learn how to do these things themselves and they'll only do that. You know, they say the person who never made a mistake never made anything. Um, and, and that's how we learn. Thanks. Thanks for that, Helen. Have you any last thought? I think just, you know, look at um, they're, they're in good hands in the school. Um, we're in um, local parentis for, I think, about 5,000 hours in the year. So, you know, trust us. We look after them. Good one. Thank yeah. you, Neve, And thank you, everybody. And thanks for coming. We're going to leave it at that. And uh, like I said, I'll send out a link. That'll be the last email you'll get from me now is the link. To, to the video and you'll get that in the next day or so okay um thanks everyone good night Thank you everyone